Game on everybody! Another Heroes High Premier Series qualification tournament and we has, have washed up going up against Pork9. Now there's obviously two questions that immediately come to mind for everybody that is watching this right now and that is paying close attention to the European scene. First of all, why is washed up called washed up again and not washed France? Answer is actually quite simple. I asked Hazu earlier about it and he said like, well we kind of realized washed France sounds kind of stupid so we went back to washed up. Back in the day when they renamed themselves it kind of made sense. The team changed a few members, a lot of them were French so they went into washed France. But obviously washed up makes a lot more sense, most people still know them as washed up anyways. So that changed, no problem here. Pork9 on the other hand, a new team with Mopsio. Mopsio, if you paid attention the last time that we had the tournament, left his former team, nothing changed, who by the way went through another game name change too, but that is a story for another match and for another day. But Mopsio now founded his own team together with Svamkorada, Galnegulna, with Rack and with Monkey. So actually a lot of players that you should know if you're paying attention to the European scene and that you have already seen around here. And it is a team that definitely has potential, but we'll see how far they can go here. So the new team going up against Washed Up here. We are looking currently at Tomb of the Spider Queen in the best of three series, our first map. And the immediate ban against Samuro. Doesn't come as a shock, if you're familiar with Europe, then you know that Monkey and Kierva are two of the players that very regularly pick Samuro whenever they get a chance to do that. So in this case, we're actually having Samuro banned out. Definitely a target ban right here, plus also Chen and ETC now eliminated. And we have Alarak taken off the board too. So Tomb of the Spider Queen is the stage for the first one, and an insta Vala pick for Swamp Grotta. Not even hesitating for a split second. Bam, pick comes in, boom, it's Vala time. All right, so we're gonna see what exactly he can pull off with that. Also, we have to answer the question, is there going to be a Tassada with Vala? Is there gonna be a Zarya? AKA, do we have any shields in addition to the support? Or is it going to be uh, Vala without any special support, just a second damage dealer in the back line? Rega comes through and Johanna, which pretty much already covers the wave clear actually for washed up here. So we're having with a lightning shield, Rega contributing to the cause. In addition to that, the condemn on Johanna, which can always do a lot here, obviously. So the rotation between lanes, if you want to go for that, can definitely work out. But this is the moment of truth. Do you go for a Tassada pick? Yes or no? I mean, there's obviously a little bit more than just simply adding the extra shield for Vala. You want to have vision around the two turning points. You want to get a bit of additional interrupt potential also when your opponent tries to get rid of their gems. In this case, they're not relying on Tassada, but with Hanzo and with Malfurion, they can pretty much serve the same purpose, at least when it comes to the interrupts. Both of the heroes have quite a few skills that they can use in order to interrupt the channel on the tribute spot. Uh, so that works out nicely for them. With the bans incoming, Washed Up now has to answer the question if they're a bit worried about a potential Tassada coming through. But with the setup that we're actually already seeing for Pork9, it would mean that if you pick Tassada here, you can only pick one frontliner. Now that kind of works if you have a double support, but it's still something that is not really all that common. Every now and then, every now and then in a blue moon, you see that happening in a high level play, but normally you will still see a dedicated melee hero on the offlane and then a full on tank. So in this case, it would have been a little bit weird for them to ban out something like Tassada. If anything, there would have been a chance for them to ban out Zarya if they would be worried about that. But now Chromie is banned, and on the other side, we're having even more wave clear added for Washed Up, going into Gul'dan and into Blaze. Great offlaner now, of course, for Washed Up too. And Gul'dan. Could horrify can completely wreck the opponent even though it was buffed again we haven't seen rain of destruction used in the european scene on the highest level in a game that was at any point on the fence but now the last two picks for pork nine for our new team what are we going to get for mopsio and obviously what is monkey going to take there's also a stitches pick still a horrible skin and Leori coming. All shall suffer, ladies. And Tracer for Nick as we're heading into our first game of this best of three series. Ladies and gentlemen, washed up against Pork in 9, the Hero Side Premier Series, Tomb of the Spider Queen, first game of the best of three. Game number one, everyone. Washed up against Pork in 9, the new team in red on the right side. But first of all, let's focus our attention a little bit to washed up here. House of Obson Gul'dan, Nick on Tracer today again with Banana H on Rega, Masquerade on Johanna and Dequaza on Blaze. Over to the right side of the map, our newly formed team with Svam Grotta on Vala, Galnugulna on Malfurion, 
Monkey playing Leoric with Austin's Renewal on level 1. We're seeing Hanzo played by Rack and Mopsio on Stitches. Alright, time to shine. Let's see what the boys in red can do here. First of all, when it comes to the talents, we have Laws of Hopes. No hold your ground on Johanna. Still pretty important. At the same time, patchwork creation right now. Taken on the side of Stitches. It's a pretty good map to take that talent. Lanes are close. You will have a lot of minions die there. So they can check that out. And obviously a lot of the attention is going to be on Tracer and Vala. The two auto attackers here will play a big role in this game. And especially the setup that Nick could play here together with the remaining part of the roster for a quick blow up thanks to his heroic ability might be something that they might use in order to just go through the opponent. Double tag team action already down at the bottom of the map against Monkey trying to put the off laner in a situation where he has a tough time in the one-on-one -on -one matchup against Blaze by attacking him with two heroes and dropping his HP early on. But at the same time, there's the kill coming in against Vala. Nice lockdown and Tracer gets the kill. Monkey with a quick pause. So the question immediately poses itself if everything is okay for Swam Grotta because there was very little reaction out of him when all of this here happened. But I want to come back to something that I actually just talked about. We had an attack at the bot lane against Monkey and he was actually forced to tap the fountain. So if you're playing a game on your own and you want to make sure that your off laner has a bit of an easier time on the lane in the one versus one, you can send a hero that has a lot of mobility like Tracer for example over to the off lane, attack the hero a little bit with the two of them and therefore you will be able to put him on the back foot. He will have to tap early and his entire timing is going to be messed up a little bit which gives an advantage for your own offlaner. So a little move that you can make at the beginning of the game if there is a dedicated one-on-one uh, -on -one lane in your setup. Outside of that, we're still having the potential four-man rotations here from the two teams. But note that Midequaza actually has also used that freedom that he had after pushing the bottom wave out together with Tracer to rotate into the middle. And those are exactly these rotations that you have to pay attention to as well. So every single time that you can just push out the opponent's wave completely and have a little bit of wiggle room, we are seeing moves like this. The next wave has to be caught eventually, but right now they are losing very few of those minions, if any, and that allowed Dequaza on his blaze to move straight into the mid lane. And with that, he has, of course, the opportunity to get a quick stun in, which eventually then led to the death of Vala too. So Vala already down, and since she is one of the main damage dealers here for the team in red, that's always a fantastic kill for the blue team. And Washed Up achieves another thing with it too. It's a huge amount of the wave clear that we are actually seeing from uh, Pork9. So in this case, the death timer is already really low. I mean, we're only one minute into the game, but obviously it starts to matter a bit because you will see the blue team now taking a bit of a dominant position in the middle of the map. Slight leading experience for them too, but they can now start a rotation towards the bot lane with Tracer again if they want. The Quasa is definitely going to move here. And of course, the top lane is always another target for them when they try to move in and just like dominate those waves by clearing it. So when you have a map like this, your idea is not necessarily that you are trying to force a fight when you rotate between the middle and the top and back up. So just focus on the minion wave. Your opponent will always have to play a little bit of a catch-up game and might eventually find one of their heroes in an awkward position that they can't really deal with. And as we're back to business, we're heading immediately into the rotation that I just talked about. So already Hazel and Masquerade up to the top trying to burn this down and look at the bot lane. Quick rotation towards Monkey. And they're also trying to sneak towards the Siege Giant camp, which, thanks to the kill against Vala, is now pretty much open for them. So they're kind of pull that off right now. Monkey might sniff that out eventually, but at this point, with two heroes already present and the third one sitting at the sides, aka Blaze, we should easily get this one. So, as it seems, it was actually a disconnect from Svam Grotta that caused all of this, which makes sense, as I said before. He didn't really react on Vala when he had a bit of a chance to escape that gank. But now Monkey gets also heavily attacked, which is making it very difficult for him to deal with those Siege Giants, especially since Tracer is still sitting around too. Now hook against the Giants, that makes sense, since obviously the two turrets can now deal with this. But there's still a little bit of damage against one of the towers, and that's always worth a lot. But yeah, with this set, a little bit of an experienced lead, nothing too fancy. We're having the rotations coming through, a little bit of a bomb pressure against Leo, and that obviously forces Monkey back again. The level 4 talents are ready, and with this we get the Consumed Soul, first of all. But we're also having, in addition to that, for Rega now, the Healing Totem taken. 
Another important one. The Quasa hooked, but of no consequence since the bottom tower has already been eliminated previously. Punishment makes a lot of sense. Strangling Vines also coming in. And we're still having the aggression in the middle of the map. And note that we actually see at this point a camp taken from the red team as Pork9 is trying to push through the mid lane and take some of these structures down or at least severely damage them. Same comes as Galnugulnar gets attacked and that's a bomb connected. The kill goes through Johanna but nicely played by Nick and he's not... Yeah, he's not satisfied with that. He wants to go for another one. They get the second and they get the third kill. Absolute disaster for Pork9. At this point, they lost three heroes, and that means they lost a lot of gems. They are sitting at 24 gems right now that are in their possession, and the opponent is already in possession of 50. Very, very annoying situation here. Dequaza, even with the jet propulsion, a little bit quicker to the gate so that he can catch the rest of the experience that came through here. But a very nice setup, and especially Nick on Tracer once again doing a lot of work here. Really dancing around the opponent and especially around Malfurion's roots, making sure that he gets the damage connected. And that led to the initial kill against Malfurion and then obviously the subsequent kills against Vala in particular, but also Hanzo. Galnugul now wants to turn in at least a few gems, that's working out for him, but the Quasa is making sure that they get the first objective. Blue Weep Weavers are going to descend for the team washed up. And with that, they have also level 7 talents and a half level lead. And that could really spell disaster. I mean, we're talking about a camp already pushing through the middle of the map. If they can hold on to that a bit longer and it doesn't get cleared right away, then they might be able to enhance that push even more. And this is not a good situation for Pork9. Not at all. And here we go. The tower's are already down as the Web Weavers are on the ground. And this is getting tricky. Top lane completely ignored for the time being. Level 7 is soon going to be ready for Pork9, but so far it isn't. Bomb this time doesn't connect as nicely as before. Nick is not quite able to lock it in. But we still have level 7 right now. In addition to that, the bot lane gets attacked heavily. Monkey is being pushed out. Monkey is in trouble. Monkey is low. Monkey is about to die and he has 21 gems. And he goes down. Gems will be recovered though. Galnik will not grabs them. But it could seal the fate of the fort at the bottom of the map. And that's not the only thing that is currently under pressure. Up to the top, Swam Grotta on his Vala is getting a bit of a beating too. Courtesies of Washed Up. And we're having the fort also getting attacked. Uh oh. That was nearly a kill against Drag. Nick is low, but Dequaza is helping out. Nicely done. Yep, well played by him. Top lane still fighting slightly. Uh, nice attempt here. That was actually a little bit unfortunate for Mopsy on Galen It was a good hook and the follow-up was there. The problem is that Masquerade, as Johanna got hooked, collided with the wall and therefore the route did not 100% connect the way that they intended to. But as it stands, with 5 kills against 0 and an entire level lead, the situation is dire for Pork9. Yep. They really need to come up with a plan to come back into this. Level 10 might help them. The problem is it's much quicker available to the blue team. And Washed Up is currently attempting to uh, transform that little snowball into an avalanche. And if they can uh, prevent the turn-in from coming through here, that would be fantastic as well. The longer they can delay it, the better for them. Once level 10 is in their hands, they should be ready to get the double turn-in. They're missing a couple of gems to make that reality, but not too many. And with this rotation towards the top, they're already connecting a fair amount of the gems that they are still missing. Five more, and they're going to be ready for it. And already a turn in attempt at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to put it, uh, Masquerade into a bit of an awkward spot there. But he just turns it around and says, you want to fight? All right, guys, let's fight. Let's go. Talking about fighting, Monkey at the bottom of the map also needs to be cautious. Still up against two. There's the level 10 abilities now. That gives us the bunker. It also gives us the blessed shield, the horrify. Hook against Rhaegar, doesn't connect. Bot lane pressure against Leoric 2. Ah, and Masquerade is missing the blessed shield. Yeah, misses the blessed shield. But again, the turn in ready for Dayquaza. Heals himself up a little bit as he does that. And puts the web weavers onto the ground once more. Now, this time at least, Pork9 is going to have level 10 once that the web weavers arrive. It's a little bit of a saving grace for them. Silver lining in this situation. 
can try and force the battle, but they have to get some kills in. And guys, you just look at the top, and that fort is pretty much gone already. I mean, those web weavers are definitely going to destroy this one. That's one of the reasons why the main force of Washed Up is currently concentrating onto the middle of the map. They're not really in a position where they want to push for the keep yet, but they're definitely trying to get every single fort eliminated so that all of those fountains are gone. And so that their path to safety is a lot longer for Pork Knight whenever a battle happens around the turning points. Top lane, Ford is already down. And now comes the fight here at the bottom. Leo has to deal with the bot lane. Tracer comes in. Rack at the Horrify against the mobs. Mopsio is low and Mopsio is down. 32 gems in his hands. And they're zoning them out completely. Well, this one got, I got a few, but the main bulk got taken. And that is just getting worse and worse and worse for Pork 9. Yeah, this is getting rough. This is getting really rough. Those little pork chop up there, they're getting grilled right now. <laughs> and it seems that with that kill, we're actually seeing a play for boss. Now, that is a little bit ambitious, I would say. But they are still going for it. They Quasa is checking if someone is moving in. But since Leo just shows at the bottom of the map, they know that they have enough time. And it seems to me as if Pork9 is currently just trying to turn in and will trade in one Web Weaver wave for the boss defense. I mean, obviously they know what's happening. So, yep, they turn in, they buy themselves a little bit more time, they buy themselves a free boss defense, unless they lose that fight now. Oh, that is not looking good. Galgulna is in trouble, nearly goes down. Dequaza is moving deep, and here comes the blessed shield as we're seeing the bunker go down. Galgulna is dead. Dequaza moves in again, wants to go. F oh my god, that's condemn. Not bad, and Leo is going to drop. Leo is going to drop, and guys, he has 21 gems. Leo had 21 gems, and they just lost all of them. It's a absolute catastrophe for them. Yeah, the gems are just dropping everywhere here. Up to the top, the boss gets defended. Level 13 is ready. It's 8 kills against 0. What a setup for washed up here. Well played by them thus far. But as it stands, another kill attempt against Monkey. Uh, Leo is currently trying to activate the trade value, it seems. So once again, he gets attacked. The condemn comes through, and that's the kill. The coordination on the side of washed up is just a little bit too much right now for Port 9. Yeah, they're sitting there, chop chop, trying to do something, but things are dire. Especially with the Earth Shield now even supplying more safety, especially for Tracer whenever Nick wants to make a play. They're already nearly done with the defense. It's nine kills against zero right now. And you look at the gem count again, I mean, what, what are we looking at here? Another turn in, the third one, four washed up if they want it. And at the same time, we don't have enough gems for Pork9 to even get half of their second turn in. They're just getting murdered the entire time. The setup of Pog 9 is really trying to get a good hook with a follow-up from Malfurion and then obviously get the damage in with Hanzo, with Vala. That's one of the tools that they have and so far nothing of that has really worked out. So they are constantly under pressure and they have a tough time here breaking through it. Once again the attack, Nick in trouble, recalls out, Arrow doesn't hit anything as Hanzo is trying to be sexy. We're having a double kill against Malfurion and Vala and now the body blocks as Monkey is once again the target of Washed Up. He's about to fall and we're seeing Mopsio in a lot of trouble to the mobs is once again uh, getting kicked on the ground that's four heroes down and the world is washed up oyster i mean they're just moving through this like hot butter through cheese it is insane 13 kills against zero kind of crazy to be honest with you i mean the, th the 13 talents are finally ready for pork nine but that doesn't really help them in the last battle they didn't have those so it was a talent advantage for Washed Up, who now claim another talent advantage since they hold level 16 in their hands. The Ruinous Affliction is already coming in, and they are pushing straight for keep number one, and I don't think uh, anybody can stop them, especially with Nick just completely on a roll right now. I mean, he is insane. He gets another kill here, and they are now sitting at 42,000 damage for Tracer. Banana H is low! And get saved, but Leo locks him down, and that is it. Rega literally feeding. First kill for the red team, but it might also be the only kill. I mean, at this point, Vala is barely surviving. Three heroes are dead again, and the core is getting attacked. Not quite sure they can end here. Everybody seems low, but it's some serious damage against that core. Honestly, it's way more damage than I expected. They are 55. I think they might have been able to end there after all. But they would have taken the risk. I honestly understand the choice to not go for the core here. 
because yes there's a chance that they could have ended it right now but they're so far ahead and if the opponent with a two nearly three level disadvantage gets two three kills in against the blue team then thanks to the underdog bonus in experience that would have given them a huge amount of xp that would have allowed them to catch up with washed up so good choice to play it safe not risking anything and just playing it out because they know they are so far ahead it's nearly impossible for the opponent to come back here Condemn comes in. That's a good arrow from Hanzo, but I don't think it's going to change anything for Leo. Ah, it might. The Quasar's in trouble. The Quasar's actually going to die. The Quasar is down. Gems are all of a sudden being lost. Yes, Leo is also dead, but here come the Web Weavers for the blue team, and that's what they really wanted to deal or to end the game with. Yes, they're starting to move in now. So two heroes, two kills for Pork 9. And by now we're having the Web Weavers in the middle of the map again. Bottom keep should be defended. Top keep, on the other hand, will suffer a lot. But it's the mid lane that is obviously quite important because there's a double catapult that is accompanying this entire move. Oh, Nick! Yeah, rushing away here as Monkey comes in. Uh, drops the Entomb. Unfortunately for him, only on Johanna. That didn't do anything for him. Monkey again on the run. And that keep is about to be blown to pieces, but I think they can save it for the time being. So they actually doing quite well digging their heels in right now and just holding this a bit longer now we're having currently in the middle of the map i don't think they have well there are 31 gems not another turn in 16 talents are ready though and that gives us frost shot and they are obviously a little bit scared that the boss is going to be taken again fishing hook maybe the tool to come back in this game get a jpl uh, jpl hook in and we might be talking Nice pressure at the bottom of the map now too, since the Siege Giants have been taken again. So Siege Giants plus the occasional catapult has obviously put the pressure on. Leo will have to deal with that. But it opens up a 5 versus 4 opportunity for washed up towards the top. And let's see. They're trying to go for the boss again. Honestly, they can just posture around at the boss because as long as those Siege Giants are in the bot lane, that's all that they need. Tracer comes in. Wants to be aggressive. Oh my god, nearly takes down Rack. The Blessed Shield did not connect, or that would have been a kill. The Quasa zooms out. Ah, Void Prison is not in the game since Zeratul is obviously not drafted, but the Entomb connected with two of them. But thanks to uh, the bunker, everybody gets away, and they even get a kill against Leo on the way back. Frostjot slows them down a little bit, though. Yeah, not a big hook, and that could be a kill, and wow. <laughs> the Quasa gets away. De Quasa gets away, Nick is zipping around, wants to kill against Mopsio, but does not get it. Uh, Vala in an attempt to drop this, but as mentioned before, down to the bottom of the map, the situation has become dire since those Siege Shines are obviously doing some work. Catapults also now attempting to home in onto the core, and with the defense that has now to be set up, there is nobody defending the boss, and Washed Up is taking advantage of that immediately. Stitches is going to try for a long distance hook here, but Leo has to defend. He's still visible. He's still sitting on the lane here, and they're abandoning the bottom keep. They're just giving it up. They realize that Leo has to help out, or the boss is going to be taken. That would be the end of the game. But level 20 is only half a level away right now. So as it stands, the situation is absolutely shitty no matter what you do. The keep is there taking damage at the bottom of the map. Level 20 is soon going to be around for the opponent. They don't quite yet have enough gems to turn in. It's tough. It's really tough. Valon 54,000 damage. 68k for Tracer. At the same time now. Ah, and Tracer not the only one. I mean, Gul'dan is sitting at 47. Finally, the fence is through. 50% damage on the keep, so it's up for the taking whenever you want it. And they're waiting for 20. Storm Talents. Storm Talents is all that they want right now, and there they have it. Demonic Circle has now been claimed. We're having double Storm Shields. One Storm Shield, one Blinded by the Light. And in addition to that, the Fortified Bunker Plus get stuff. Ah, that didn't connect. And now it's simply the question what they're going to try and do with it. At this point, they can move through the middle and then just rotate towards the top or the bottom and get one of the two keeps, or unless they get kills. Oh yeah, with the double camp in particular, they could try and make the play here for the core immediately. There we go, pushing out the bot lane. Double camp in the middle of the map that has to be dealt with. Port 9 needs to deal with it, but they can't do everything at once. The bottom keep is eliminated. They have to try and defend this. They uh, just split themselves thin wherever they can, but it's a tricky situation right now. And for Washed Up, it's nearly a guaranteed win unless they completely fuck up here. Or unless we see a couple of god hooks for Mopsio, and he's definitely trying. But he wasn't able to uh, get a follow-up on this one. 
Uh, with level 20 now, they could also soon turn in again. I mean, they have 46 gems right now, so they are pretty much two gems short of getting the next turn in here for themselves. Well, a little bit more than that, but yeah, not much. Uh, there we go. Fire. Oh, that's a kill. Vala down. This time the setup is there. Horrify, Blessed Shield, and Tracer. That's all you need. Mopsy goes down with 46 gems. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be the conclusion. No way out of this one. Boss is open. There's a turn in available. You can go for the core directly. It's just a question. How do you want to end the game? All, yeah. You can pretty much go for five different variations right now. And the biggest problem that Pork9 has at this point is the question whether they want to type GG in caps lock or not. GG, a five-man team wipe towards the end of game number one in our first best of three series at the Heroes High Premier Series today. Well played by Washed Up as the blue team takes the lead in the best of three. Game 9? Uh, no. Game 2. Pork 9. Our Porkies here. They are... Like, I don't really know what exactly we're going for with that nickname, but I, I want to call them Little Piggies the entire time. Uh, either way, we're currently having Infernal Shrines as our second map, but I gotta say... Game 1? That was a pretty good performance by Washed Up. That was actually really, really well done here. So, the question remains, can Pork 9 turn that around? Again, new team, give them a little bit of time, good players on their side, 100%. They will need a bit of time to really form that synergy that you expect. We've seen that with other teams too. That's nothing insane, that's nothing new. But it's really interesting to me to see if they can maybe already on the second map just show a little bit of a different game. Because you always, they sometimes run into a draft or a little bit of an early game that just goes against you. And then you have to recover from that. You might not be able to get anything done in that one game. And especially when we're looking at a map like Tomb of the Spider Queen. I mean, it is a snowballing map. So with that, we're currently having a Samoro ban down again. Shocking. Question that I have is, will Tracer be banned out? That's a more important one. And instead, it is Zaratul. Okay. Zaratul banned. Monkey is not going to get his Samuro either. Uh, what else are we going to get from Monkey? Well, Alara gets banned. So they banned exactly the same stuff that they banned on map number one. Not really giving them any of the preference picks here. But the Instavala first pick that we saw in game number one is apparently not happening this time. They might still pick Vala, but they're definitely a little bit more hesitant about what they wanted to play right now. Vala's great on Infernal Shrines though, and they agree and pick her again. Our little cowgirl is going to make an appearance. So it's fantastic because with the multi-shot hybrid build you get a lot of value, not only in hero damage, but also towards the objective whenever you fight on the shrine itself. So she is still extremely strong here. But this is another map where you can in theory play also with Tacita or with Zarya, since you will have a lot of AoE together with that. And that's something they could try here right now, if they wanted to. Same opening for Washed Up as we've seen in the previous game. That's actually becoming more of a tradition. Washed Up has actually played the Johanna and Blaze composition quite a lot and has also focused on picking the two of them very early in the draft. But even though they have taken Blaze in the last game, they are prioritizing Johanna and Rega currently over that. Now, wave play is again important towards the objective and Johanna is just in general a really beefy tank to have at the front line. Has obviously also the, the blind, not one of the primary reasons why you would pick her here, but it's definitely still quite powerful. Ah, uh, and Malfurion against ETC. I should probably specify this a little bit more. It is definitely a reason why you pick her, but it's not... Like, a lot of people with heroes still think that in drafts you have a rock-paper-scissors setup where you see an auto-attack on the other side, and just because you pick one or two blinds, the opponent's team is all of a sudden falling apart. And that is just such a wrong concept and such a wrong way to think about drafts. Uh, in Heroes of the Storm at least, that it's always scary when you encounter that. And I've encountered it a couple of times in the past few weeks, so I always want to highlight during this that it's not the primary reason why you pick a hero. It's an added bonus that you're definitely going to try and bring into play, but it's not a concept of rock, paper, scissors where you say you invalidate that Vala pick by simply picking Johanna. It's one of the reasons why some teams on the lower levels end up with Lily all of a sudden. Or why some people think that Atanas is a good hero against auto attackers, which is definitely not the case, because they're just way better offlaners than Artanis that add way more value. They might not have a blind, but they're just way stronger in general. So that misconception is one of the reasons why I sometimes go into these statements. 
But either way, as that stands, we're having Blaze, as I just mentioned, picked again by them. They really like that combo. But I like the Kalthas pick here. Kalthas on this map can be strong. They want to go into a bit of AoE. They have a little bit more CC with it. We see an Urel on the side that helps with ETC. Mobs, you can go into Power Slide, into a Malfurion route. So yeah, I like a little bit more Kalthas. Kalthas isn't really horrible. Most teams prefer other mages, but as we've gone over in a few of the previous games, if you play on Inferno Shrines or on Tomb of the Spider Queen, Kalthas can be played. He doesn't really see a lot of play in the European scene ever since Mena went over to World of Warcraft Classic, went back to his roots. And yeah, now at least we have one. And it's hammer time! It is hammer time! Likely gonna end up in the hands of Hazu, we'll find out, but this is a very powerful setup for Ashtar. This is a really, really strong power uh, setup for them. But let's see what Port9 can do. Let's see if they can actually turn around here or Washed Up takes a 2-0 victory. Game number two! Washed Up, ladies and gentlemen. Hazu on the left side for Washed Up on Hammer. Nick on Hanzo, the Quasar on Blaze. We have Banana H on Rega. And we're seeing Masquerade on Johanna again. Ooh, on the right side, Pork9. I was actually highlighting the benefits of running in a uh, multi-shot build on this map, but he goes into an arrow build instead. Now, still Monster Hunter helps you with camps, helps you with a lot more here, obviously. So, not horrible, but I still expect a multi-shot. Nice to see that we have a bit of a change there. Mobs on ETC, Monkey on Urel, Rack on Kalthas, and Galnegulna on Malfurion. But yeah, let's see how much he can get out of his arrow build here. Again, multi-shot can be fantastic on the objective, but especially in one-on-one -on -one situations, Vala is extremely powerful with this. So let's have a little bit of a look here. Well, for now it's obviously hammer time. And that's actually one of the things that a lot of the teams already learned the hard way when they were playing against Washed Up. Don't give the Germans the Panzer. When the Germans have the tanks, it's not gonna go for a happy ending. Has ops whenever he gets his hands on the hammer with a good composition. I mean, seriously, I, I'm told that some opponents ended up crying, and I don't blame them. So let's see if Hawk9 has an answer to that, has a solution to that problem. Because good hammer players that know how to position themselves, that know how to set this up, that are also protected by decent teammates, can be incredibly powerful, especially on this particular map. So, as I said in the draft, I think the composition is absolutely fantastic for Washed Up. I mean, they're currently looking at Johanna and also, together with that, Blaze, which is one of their most preferred setups here. But, oh, Hazu Ops locked down and so much for the German Panzer, huh? Yep, das war's. Direct down, ja, also down. Alright, Hazu down, but at the same time, the Quasar wants a little bit more than that. Oh, it seems like they're paying dearly for that kill. Oh, ho, ho, two down and the rest on the run. Make it a triple, baby. Yeah, that's three eliminated. Nicely done. <laughs> it started off with a nice kill against, uh, against Hazu. But then three in exchange for that. They sold the camp too, obviously, so that adds a little bit more damage. Uh, damn, ladies, that was a quick one. That turned quickly. That went from, oh yeah, we got him, to holy shit, let's get out of here. Within seconds. So, yeah. Uh, I like the amount of CC that we're having. Some of you might still remember the times when Kalthas was actually a regular in the draft and was picked on this map, actually. Uh, especially when the Chinese were still super strong. There must have been... I would say 2017, maybe even early 2018 still. I think it was 2017 mostly where we had the combo between ETC and Kalthas on this map in particular chosen very regularly since you would go from a power slide into a gravity lapse and the amount of CC and burst that you would have would allow you to get very easy kills, especially if you had follow-up stuns to go straight uh, on for it. So we'll see how it works out this time. They definitely have CC, which I really enjoy here. But they need to put that into play, especially against Hazu, and it's not going to be easy for them, as I mentioned previously. I mean, again, this position in particular is just so incredibly safe and so difficult to reach. They're uh, going to have a situation where Kelthas is going to try and drop a couple of flame strikes here, but outside of that, it's difficult to get anything done, especially since Ural is still forced towards the top. Already, Vala is getting pushed back as a single stack on her level 4. Siege tactics are going to help Hazu even more with this. There we have already the lead. Well, big lead, by the way. 22 against 9 stacks. But Hazel is still shelling the shit out of them. 
from the back line. Hammer is just sitting there enjoying the view and half a level and then we're gonna see him also moving around here. Yeah, for now though, moved away a little bit and that obviously moves with him slightly. Rack is trying to clear the waves out as quickly as he can and get themselves some experience too. But 35 against 16 is pretty much spilling already how this is going to end. I mean, that is an objective in the hands of Washtab. 100%. 100% right here. So yeah, the push straight through the mid lane. Hazo getting booped away again. A little bit annoying for him as long as he doesn't have his level 7. But as we're talking about it, the Hava Siege mode has been acquired. Obviously here the repeating arrow now also for Vala. But they're already getting that wall. And everything else that you can get in addition to that is usually just a bonus. They get some damage onto the fort, so that's pretty much a win, I'd say. Level 4 and level 7, both of them, by the way, specking straight into the shield clear. A bit more damage, nice. Johanna, ooh, Masquerade. If Masquerade would have activated that a little bit later, a little bit too soon, ETC might have been able to kill him here. Oh, but Masquerade has to be careful. It's not only the hit points that are low, his mana isn't looking too hot either. So rotating away from that. When all is said and done, the wall is down, and we see a bit of extra damage against the fort, but... Warg 9 is way... is not actually in a much better position right now. And Hazu is overstaying his welcome a little bit! Ah, just because you have a tank, baby, doesn't mean that you can't be killed, so you need to be a little bit careful there. Don't have to frontline everything. Hazu staying a bit too long, Mopsio doesn't have to be asked twice, goes in and gets the kill right here. Malfurion, on the other hand, gets also wrecked, so that is one kill. A little, ooh, there's a little bit of action over here. Vala gets down as Hanzo gets the kill. There were three heroes that were aiming for the kill. The Quasar was already setting up with the jet propulsion. Nick is getting pinged as he steals it away from Banana Age, who was ready for the jump. But Vala went down regardless. Eight stacks on her. Five kills against two. If you think about it, that's pretty much more than they got in the last... Well, it's pretty much nearly the same amount that they got in the last game. So that's not really bad. At this point, we're having uh, Banana H and Nick still going for the camps here. And over to the right side, still the attempt to get the camp before level 10 hits for the blue team. Again, the amount of CC that we're having for Pork 9 is pretty nice this game, so you need to be careful. Masquerade obviously has his iron skin. That's the reason why he waited a little bit. It was also the reason why Mopsu didn't go for a power slide, because he was expecting this to be dropped and he would have been in an awkward position if he would have used the slide. But right now they are trying to set all of this up against Hazu and others. With level 7 we are also getting the Burned Flesh standard flame strike built for him. Keep in mind that especially the Mana Addict isn't done yet, so he doesn't have that shield ready. Top lane Blaze still pushing it out. Their red team has to be cautious until they have level 10, which is now the case. And that gives us Phoenix! Ah, the difference between an A and Europe. Phoenix against the Pyroblast that we've seen in uh, North America here. Yeah. And again, Phoenix, fantastic talent to zone out the opponent a little bit, allows you to control those choke points around the objective, and Pyroblast pretty much gets, in a normal game, very little to no value, especially against this setup. Not only do you have the Iron Skin of Johanna, you have the Earth Shield on Rega, you have the Bunker as well. So we've talked, uh, I've talked about this in one of the North American games. It's just one of those games where you never want to take Pyroblast. I still have convinced more or less that there was a misclick on the North American side. But against this lineup, yeah, Pyroblast would have been an atrocious choice. Phoenix giving you so much more anyways, but this would be especially bad for them. So as it stands, we're having, outside of that, the Mosh Pit taken, and also Reign of Vengeance. Well, no strafe this time, especially with the Blessed Shield, there's obviously an interrupt, there's an arrow to consider too. There's a lot of stuns that could drop you out of the channel, if you go for that. But talking channels, it's uh, time for the next shrine. Shrine time, baby. You rally a little bit late to the party, the goat has better things to do, aka dropping the fountain. Ooh. But Malfurion is down again. Honestly, in my personal opinion, Malfurion is just old and tired and wants to lie down. That's the reason why he just drops the entire time here. He's like, oh, finally, a little bit of time here. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, unfortunate for them. Without the support, they have very little chance of getting anything done here. Apparently, ooh, they're trying to get the kill against Nick. That would have been great. Ancestral Masquerade. There's still a bit of pressure against Washed Up. But they have 32 stacks and Monkey is going down. Yeah, that's another kill. Oh, they might even get more. They Quasar sees an opportunity, but nobody follows it up. And instead, the turnaround against him. He still has the ult ready, so that saves his ass. But there we go. That's a bot lane getting attacked right here with another Punisher. 
At this point, it's an arcade Punisher. So, little John Cena is going to start to jump in. Dee, 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 dee. Bam! Straight into the face of Mopsio. Yeah, he wants a burger. He doesn't that much. It was actually at the burger festival here in Valencia where they crowned the best burger of Valencia. And I, I had it. It was actually really good. You would be amazed. I, I, I was amazed how good the burgers actually are in Spain compared to the US. I gotta say, I think they're better. I had one of my American friends here not, uh, pretty recently. And we went to a few burger places, and he had to admit that the uh, burgers here were actually fantastic. So right now, <laughs> oh, that save! Mopsio nearly down. That was a really cool attempt by Washed Up, but it was also a nice save from Pork9. The forts are still down, that includes the one in the bot lane and the one in the middle. Seven kills against two. And with that, we're looking at 22,000 damage for Vala. 32,000 damage for Hanzo, way ahead of Hammer, I might add. Way ahead of him. And yeah, so far so good. At this point, they quasi us to getting the experience top line. Quest completed for Kelthas. That's always nice. So that means that he's going to be a little bit safer here. Siphoning arrow. And we're having the Pyromaniac as well. They are not giving up. It's a level It's a level difference. It's a level difference in the two forts are obviously down. But they still have a chance to come back into that. Especially once that Vala is able to complete her quest. ETC for him the same. And yeah, uh, looks very solid for now, if we can complete those quests before the next shrine, as long as they don't have to fight against level 16 talents, they're going to be Gucci. But let's see, there's the attack against Masquerade, eats a little bit of damage. This is, by the way, the big difference between like low level play and the higher level play. When you see living bombs applied, what happens in the low level league is the guy that has the living bomb on him wants to share the pain with the rest of the team. Whereas in uh, the, on this level of play, nobody really does that. Instead, they're trying for little actions like this. That didn't really work out as intended. But coming back to Kalthas, in low level play, living bomb builds, for example, give you a lot of value because people just don't know how to properly split once the living bombs get applied and instead keep stacking, so living bombs are fantastic. But when you're talking about this particular setup, then you always want to go into a flame strike build and Kel'Thas just gets way more, uh, gets way more value through that. Also, it's the range that really is important on the Netherwind instead of the cooldown reduction, which is another one, since you always are aiming for the additional CC follow-up after an opponent sets this up. So this is one of the key Huge differences here. Uh, and one of the reasons why Kelth is in the lower leagues is oftentimes even more valuable than anything you can see here all the way up the top. The question actually pops up all the time. Why isn't Kelthas banned or picked immediately? And well, that's the reason. Kelthas can be good on maps like Infernal Shrines or Tomb of the Spider Queen, but he loses a lot of value between low level league play and between competitive and organized play simply because of the coordination and the knowledge that those players have. Masquerade is a little bit far out and that's an early, an early trade that he uses but the level 16 is ready for them and Pork9 is not going to be happy fighting into that, I can tell you that much. Giant Killer on the side of Sergeant Hammer is incredibly strong right now. And on top of that, we're also seeing here the Holy Renewal for extra sustain. Yeah, there comes the BFG again, as Hazu drops the big fucking gun. Once again, Svamgrotta on the run here, trying to get away, already low. The bunker in place too, Monkey, Monkey, drops the ult, tries to get out here, and hops away just before he can get dropped. Mopsio is also a little bit hit, but is able to retreat. Shrine is active. And that's the moment when you're trying to set this up. And by the way, looking towards the bot lane, Catapult coming in. One Catapult already here. Wave is pushing in through. That's going to eliminate the wall eventually. Yeah, so they're under pressure right now. At this point, starting to move in. Ooh, Hazu! And yep, moves away. Once again, able to escape here. But we're having a little bit more damage now from Kalthas as he's starting to move in, but not having the level 16 down is a problem for them. Ancestral, a little bit premature, but better safe than sorry. They still get the kill against Ural, and that's great for them. Galnagul now is low. The stun doesn't connect. Blaze in trouble. They're trying to get it, but Malfurion is already dead. The old geezer once again a little bit too lazy to participate in the fight for any longer than he has to. Mopsio goes down. And Svamgarotta might fall as well, but he is actually getting the kill against Johanna. Nice! <laughs> Both are missing. Both shots are missing, but that could have been theoretically a kill against Svamgarotta too. Either way, it's the end of the ambitions that the red team had for the top. 
So yeah, with this man, we're gonna see another Punisher in the hands of Washed Up. Pork is already trying to defend this. We're having Ignite taken. This is actually interesting that we're now having Ignite applied over him going into the Fury of the Sunwell, which I rather expected here. Ignite in and of itself, obviously not bad. But I expect him to go for the full setup here. Either way, we're having 39,000 damage. Kalsas is only sitting at 29. Another push out against the top to make sure that they're getting the forts as low as they possibly can before the objective even moves in. By the way, look at this. They're actually delaying this. They were at 39 stacks for quite some time. The reason is that they wanted Hanzo and Johanna to move back to make sure that... Well, first of all, Johanna needed to be revived and Hanzo wanted to also top up his mana. So you don't have to take the objective immediately when you know that your opponent can't contest it. So in this case, they were sitting at 39 were waiting it out a little bit just to ensure that the rest of the team would be there and help them out. Frostshot coming in on level 16. Not a bad talent. It seems a little bit counterintuitive if you go for an arrow build. A lot of people would expect the Seething Hatred here or some other choices, but Frostshot is always a really nice setup because you can poke from a distance and it helps you with the slow as well to control the fight a little bit better. But it is already a tough battle for them as it stands. It's level difference between the two. 10 against 3, arrow again missing. Camps on every single lane, by the way, pushing against washed up, but also encountering catapults. Nice BFG, mobs you nearly low. Monkey about to fall. 30 HP, and there's the kill. The Quasar gets the ancestral healing, and that is going to be the end of keep number one, and potentially the end of the game itself. A little bit questionable how this is gonna go. Keep is open, so they could make the play for keep instead for core if they wanted to. And as it seems, they're gonna play this one safe as well, already rotating back. Uh, half a level away, one level away from level 20. Not necessarily a bad choice. But I talked about the camps, the one in the middle, getting value for them. So this at least moved through the wall and is also threatening the fort. And when you take your gaze and direct it towards the bot lane, you pretty quickly see that we are seeing a similar situation unfold in front of us here too. So they're gonna get at least some structural value. But it's looking very, very solid here. So let's see. At this point, Mopsio is already sitting at the front, hoping for another opportunity to get a good power slide through. Bottom of the map, yeah, Urel is moving towards the top right now, trying to push the lane out. There's constant catapult pressure against it now, of course. So you gotta be careful with that. Camps are taken. And lo and behold, level 20. Any second right now. At this point, Arrow comes in. This time actually connecting. I'm not 100% certain where he wanted to go with that, so that didn't really connect. But at this point, it's just fire in the hole the entire time. I mean, they're just like firing everything that they have. Arrow is ready, arrow goes out. BFG is ready, BFG goes out. It's just like, let's see what we can do with this shit. Having the ultra capacitators taken again, the bullseye, fortified bunker, shit ton of shields as well. And with that now, I'll start to move through the bottom of the map to get another keep. And against level 20 talents, yeah, you don't really want to fight there. So they have to take a bit of a beating because they, well, they are going to try and take the minions down. That's why the flame strike is not directed towards heroes. And that's another thing you can actually copy. Your opponent is going to be very unwilling to fight underneath the keep when there are no minions to soak those shots. So that was actually a nice play on that end. Bless shield completely missing. Oh my god, that was a lag F moment. If I've ever seen one. I mean, holy hell, that wasn't even close. But they are going in, and they're going to take this. Good damage against Hazel the entire time. They're trying to take the keep, and they should be able to grab that. But they have to wait for another minion wave, I suppose. It's a good defense from Pork9. I mean, it's a tough defense, but so far it worked out. Keep is still there. So looking for the attack. 30 seconds until Johanna has her ult back. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Vala gets cleansed out. There's a little bit of damage against both of them. Next minion wave comes through, and that's the moment when you push in. And it's Kelthar's job again to take that minion wave down so that the opponent can't push in too hard. That's what he has to do, and what he's going to try and do. Burns that down slowly and steadily, but they're already starting to retreat. They have level 20. They're trying to take camps, but look at the experience. Pork 9. Guys, they got it. They got level 20, just in time for the next objective. And they held on to the keep. Now, barely. And that camp now taken is not going to help that cause. But it's still a setup. Uh, this could have been way worse for Pork9. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's a little last chance for them to make something happen here. But the lead on the objective already goes to Washed Up. 
So I'm not saying it's a great chance, but it's a chance. Firefly Quiver is now in. You have more safety on Kelthas thanks to the flamethrower. He can attack Hammer way more directly, which is exactly what he does. So Haza Ops needs a lot more attention from Banana H now. But they have the lead. Eventually the bot lane is going to lose the key. But they do dealt with the camp too, so there is a chance for them to actually hold this. 20, they need kills. They need kills and they need them soon. It's 11 kills against 3 right now. There's the Tranquility as they're hoping for a chance here. But the arrow connects and a little bit of damage against Galagula himself as the bunker is covering his path of retreat, cutting it off completely. In comes the kill and Malfurion goes down again. Death number 5 on the support. Ancestral healing keeping the doggy alive as they're trying to make the play for Hanzo. And, uh, well, for Urel, actually. Sorry, with so many people jumping around here. It's sometimes hard to tell. That's the kill against Urel. The goat is down. The Arcane Punisher is taken. And the door is open to end game number two. And make sure that it's 2-0 victory for washed up. Three heroes. Still haven't gotten the memo that they are behind. And are trying to fight this through. Nice bullseye against ETC. And Azu comes in with a technical right click here. Swamp Garota also low. And he gets dropped to... 15 kills against 3 and washed up just playing a fantastic series here and doing what they can to uh, well, take it with a 2-0. Perfect match pretty much without them having to uh, go to map number 3. Nicely played by the team in blue. Pork 9 definitely a team with potential even though in this series they didn't look great but with the talent that they have on their lineup we could definitely see a couple of future games from them where they do better once that they have the synergy that they need for that. But they went up against a tough opponent today. Washed up takes it. They played well. GG. And well played. As we have the victory for the team in blue. Hey guys. Thanks for watching today's video. And I hope that you enjoyed the match and the commentary. The remaining time of the video has been added to protect against spoilers caused by the length of the video itself. But please keep in mind though that this does not only mean more work for me. But also has a negative impact on the popularity of the videos and the channel because of YouTube's algorithms. It would be greatly appreciated if you'd consider supporting the channel and help me to continue the daily esports coverage by clicking the join button below the video or supporting me through the Proterium page linked in the video description. Thanks a lot for the support and see you guys next time.